An anti-clock M25. All the traffic being held just after Godstone at 6. It's a sort of an accident out. Keeping back to the M23 at Junction 7. And that's your latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. We're GB News, and we come from a proud tradition of British journalism. That's why I'm so excited to be here. It's something so new. The first news channel to be launched in Britain in over 30 years. Launched to represent the views of the British people. To go where other broadcasters refuse to go. How did you find out about the story in the first place? Launched with one aim. To be the fearless champion of Britain. It's an absolutely fantastic atmosphere here. This is GB News. The People's Channel. GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Hello there and happy Friday to you. I'm Michelle Jubri. Coming up tonight, Rishi Sunak has launched what he's called a moral mission to overhaul the benefits system in his sights. Those people who are not working because of so described ill health. I can tell you now, right, it's had so much criticism. One charity has even called it a full on assault on disabled people. What says you? And get this, a Jewish man was almost arrested recently. His crime you'll never guess, being openly Jewish and being close to the pro-Palestine protest, apparently that is antagonistic. What on earth is going on? And let me ask you this, do you care which country your food comes from? Would you make a beeline for British produce in the shops and would you be prepared to pay more for it to try and support British farmers or not? And in the height of stupidity, if you ask me, a report shows today that children as young as three, you heard that right, three, own a smartphone and apparently almost 40% of five to seven year olds now use social media. I'm sorry, but I think that is just poor parenting. But one lord tells me that I'm completely wrong and the situation is absolutely more complicated than that. What do you think? We'll have all that to come, but before we get stuck in, let's cross live for tonight's latest news headlines. Good evening, I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. Your top story this hour, the UK and Western allies are calling for de-escalation in the Middle East after reports that Israel launched airstrikes against Iran. State media says three drones were shot down with explosions heard at an airbase near the city of Isfahan. No damage or injuries have been reported in the latest exchange. The strike is thought to be in response to last weekend's attack when Iran fired a barrage of drones and missiles at Israel. Labour leader Keir Starmer has added to calls for restraint as the best way forward. I'm deeply concerned about the prospect of escalation. Escalation of the conflict in the Middle East is uh, in nobody's interest. And so it's very, very important, therefore, that everybody urges restraint on all sides. More than that, we really need that ceasefire in Gaza now um, straight away so that hostages can come out. Desperately needed aid uh, needs to get in. Desperately, desperately needed. And we need, if you like, a foot in the door for the political process to peace. 
Now, Scotland's former First Minister has spoken for the first time since her husband was charged by police. Nicola Sturgeon was questioned by journalists as she left her home in Glasgow. It's incredibly difficult, but, you know, that's not the main issue here. So, um, I can't say any more. I'm not going to say any more. Um, Peter Murrell, who was the SNP's chief executive for more than two decades before standing down last year, has been charged in connection with the embezzlement of funds. Detectives are investigating how more than £600,000 in donations for independence campaigning was spent. The 59-year-old, who is no longer in custody, has also resigned his SNP membership. The British Medical Association is urging Rishi Sunak to avoid using hostile language on what he described as sick note culture. During a major speech, the Prime Minister said 850,000 more people are out of work since the pandemic and insists he's on a moral mission to fix the problem. The proposals, though, have been described as a full assault on disabled people. Rishi Sunak recognised he'll be accused of lacking compassion but insists the UK can't afford a spiralling increase in the welfare bill. We now spend £69 billion on benefits for people of working age with a disability or health condition. That's more than our entire school's budget, more than our transport budget, more than our policing budget. And spending on personal independence payments alone is forecast to increase by more than 50% over the next four years. The Prime Minister is promising his Rwanda safety bill will be passed on Monday. Rishi Sunak couldn't confirm whether asylum flights would get off the ground by his spring deadline, but he did say his intention was to get the legislation through Parliament without further delay. He says MPs will be forced to sit in the Commons until the job is done. In other news, the Met Police has apologised after an officer used the term openly Jewish to an anti-Semitism campaigner who was near a pro-Palestine march. A video clip posted on social media showed the moment Gideon Falter was threatened by arrest by the police. You are quite openly Jewish. This is a pro-Palestinian march. I'm not accusing you of anything, but I'm worried about the reaction to your presence. The chief executive of Campaign Against Anti-Semitism was wearing a keeper skullcap when he was stopped from crossing a road near the demonstration in London last Saturday. The Met Police Assistant Commissioner said the officer's poor choice of words was hugely regrettable. Five Just Stop Oil protesters have been convicted of aggravated trespass after they disrupted a performance of Les Miserables in London's West End last year. The performance was stopped when activists stormed the stage and locked themselves to the set. An audience of around 1,000 people was asked to leave the venue and the performance was cancelled. The court was told the action cost the theatre an estimated £60,000. And squatters have vowed to stay inside a Gordon Ramsay pub until they're evicted. Some were spotted leaving the venue this morning after the celebrity chef's lawyers secured a court order. But it's not clear how many people are still in the building. The group shut themselves in the York and Albany in North London last week. They claim the legal system's designed for the rich and argue the building has been left empty for years in an area with some of the worst levels of rough sleeping in the country. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Michelle. Thanks very much for that, Sophia and Michelle Jubri, alongside me till seven, the political commentator Benedict Spence and the trade unionist and author Paul Embry. Good evening to you. That last story, um, I covered this on the show the other day about that squatting in Gordon Ramsay's pub. I think it's so disgraceful that people think that they somehow have the right to just go into an empty property, literally because it's empty, and do with it what they please. Moral, you know, high five the um, the social purpose and the soup kitchen and all that. Brilliant! I think that's a great uh, endeavour. Go and raise your own investment, buy your own property or lease your own property, and then open up your own soup kitchen. You can't just take someone else's. Have you seen the price of property today, Michelle? 
Well, it's yeah, it's extortionate. It yeah, just... but it depends on the property. I mean, if you want some huge listed pub, then of course it's going to cost you a small fortune. I think 13 million was the price tag on that one. But, but you know, the, the, the truth is we've got a housing crisis. The truth is that you property... don't support squatters, surely. No, 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 I don't. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is, it's not as easy as just simply saying that people should go and buy property. The prices of property these days are astronomical. And a bit of direct protest is not a bad thing, necessarily. So would you mind, if you went on your holidays and someone rocked up to your house oh, and set up a, a soup kitchen in your spare room or in your lounge as a bit of direct protest, would you think that's fine? Well, if the, if the cooking was better than my wife's, I might accommodate well, it. But, but it would never be. Actually, it, would, it would never be, of course. I must make that very, You're very clear. You're on the warpath today. Otherwise, I'm not, I'm not getting in the house tonight <laughs> when I get back. That's not a bad shout, actually. No one ever cooks for me. So maybe that's what I do need. Do you maybe what I need, though. yeah, I do. Maybe that's what I need actually. In my own kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. But I actually, I shouldn't say that out loud. I might plant seeds in the minds <laughs> of idiots that might take me up on that. Uh, anyway, hello everybody. Happy Friday to you. Uh, get in touch with me tonight. All the usual ways. What's on your mind tonight? GBnews.com uh, slash your say on the website. You can chat to me on there. Of course, you can email me. Uh, you can tweet or x me. Jen says she loves Friday nights. Uh, it's film and takeaway night. She says. Uh, after jubes. There you go. Who needs cooking? Who needs cooking for when you can go around to Jen's and have a free takeaway? Where does she live? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where, yeah, where do you live, Jen? Where We're all you, Jen? piling. We're all well, piling around. Who's going to your house? This is, this yes, is insane. It's great. Everybody is just going to each other's Let's just house. all go no to each other's house. pile around Jen's Friday yeah. night. Fabulous. Bring a bottle. Well, you won't be able to bring Rishi Sunak, though, because he's in trouble today. I don't think he'd be welcome in many people's homes because uh, he has unveiled plans. What he is uh, saying is on a moral mission, mission, basically. It's all about this so-called sick note culture of Britain. In his sights, he's got those people that are on long-term sickness. He thinks that uh, it's too much, especially when it comes comes to young people, uh, especially when it comes to things like mental health and all the rest of it, but he's also got these so-called, they're not called sick notes, they're called fit notes, and whether or not GPs should be prescribing them or handing them out, basically, he's suggesting that perhaps there's a conflict of interest. Maybe the doctor might like the person a bit much and feel bad and sign them off, etc. I think it's a very tricky thing because obviously there are people who are long-term ill who aren't able to work and you know often when you have these sorts of crackdowns on people uh, exploiting the benefit system you worry about people sort of getting caught up in the crossfires but there's no question that certainly since the pandemic and the subsequent lockdowns that accompanied them there has been a massive uptick in the number of people leaving the workforce both the elderly just deciding actually that they've had enough and young people younger people deciding actually uh, they aren't fit to work, they have uh, poor mental health. And the problem is, as much as nobody wants to sit here and go, no, you need to pull yourself together, you need to get back to work, the numbers aren't really sustainable and they aren't coming down, which suggests that the issues aren't actually being solved. People aren't being cured, they're not being given the sort of help they need, they are just staying off work. That's not actually a good thing. You know, perhaps they don't want to go back to work, but it can't be a situation where, you know, we have... Uh, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people where you're effectively just told, well, you can take medication and, you know, whenever, if ever you feel better, you can come back. That's not a very... Well, I wouldn't argue that's a very progressive thing. And on the subject of GPs, mental health is not actually necessarily the same as sort of physical health. Uh, GPs' jobs encapsulate in all sorts of things. And actually, we do have mental health specialists precisely because it's not the same sort of area that the average GP might have trained on. It wasn't a particularly prevalent thing 10, 20 years ago. Um, and again, you know, the ways of actually addressing it, the ways of dealing with it, the ways of spotting it, what is severe, what isn't, I think is a very different way uh, to, to, to noticing physical ailments. So perhaps he has a point about GPs not necessarily diagnosing people with poor mental health, but, you know, generally for people who are physically ill, I think it would be a very bad idea to take the power away from a GP to say this person isn't well enough to work. Well, Rishi Sunak was actually uh, putting some numbers on this. Listen to some of the costs involved in some of this stuff. We now spend £69 billion on benefits for people of working age with a disability or health condition. That's more than our entire school's budget, more than our transport budget, more than our policing budget. And spending on personal independence payments alone is forecast to increase by more than 50% over the next four years. It's not sustainable, is it, Paul? Yeah, but why are so many people disincentivised from working, Michelle? Is there an epidemic of bone idleness? Some people undoubtedly are lazy, some people are bone idle. Um, but I think the vast majority of people in this country want reward in work. But there isn't reward in work at the moment. What we've got is the gig economy, what we've got is zero hours contracts. 
What we've seen is the decimation of our industry, our manufacturing base. We've seen rampant deindustrialization, the sorts of blue collar jobs and industries that instilled a sense of pride in people and in communities. Those largely don't exist anymore because we've put all of our eggs in the basket of financial services. And we look upon industry as if it's kind of dirty, menial work. Think of Tony Blair saying that 50% of young people should go to university, not because he thought they should be working in factories with blue collars, because he thought they should be working in the city with white collars. And we look down upon that sort of work. So if you're a working class person in one of those communities, you kind of think, well, and by the way, I'm not defending scroungers, OK? I think the welfare system should be a safety net, not a comfort blanket, as the old saying goes. But it has to be a two-pronged thing. You have to give people an incentive to get up in the morning and to say, we are providing you with good, solid, sustainable jobs in good, solid, sustainable industries. And that has gone from our country, and we've paid a huge price for it. Do you, do you want to respond to that? I think there's something in there about work not paying. I think everybody recognises that, and we see that sort of uh, in the housing crisis, the fact that sort of a younger generation of people are struggling to save up enough. I think were, uh, you know, wages to be raised slightly in certain sectors, I do actually think you'd see a lot more people discovering they weren't that unwell to work, and actually they might go back to it if it, if it paid better than benefits did. But I just want to touch upon what you said, which is about working-class <coughs> people because I don't think this is necessarily a working-class issue. I suspect a lot of these people are middle-upper-middle-class people. I think that it's not something that just affects one certain uh, cohort of society. I suspect in some ways... I mean, what we often see with mental health conditions, mental illnesses, is that it is mimetic. There are elements to it which are fashionable. In certain circles, you notice it a lot, you'll get a lot of people coming down with the same issues in the same school and they just happen to be in the same classrooms. It's one of those things that is not particularly well understood that it is a social contagion as much as it might be a physical one, as much, it meant, as much as it might be a mental one. So it's not, again, I say it's not necessarily something that you can just say, oh, it's working class people having, having a rubbish time. I suspect there is also an element of the, just lots of people in the same sorts of group, and therefore I do think you'll see a lot of it in the upper and middle classes and, as and well. The thing but is... the other thing that I'd say is it's really easy to medicate this, because you go to the GP and they just give you your note and your pills and off you go. But that's not a very healthy way long-term. If you look at the links between antidepressants and psychosis, for example, it's really not a healthy way of dealing with it. And that's why I go back to what I originally said, is we're not seeing these numbers coming down. And that's something that really does need to be addressed. Even if and you do say we need to offer people more money to get back into work, we also need to get people off antidepressants far faster than we currently do. And it's not just a financial thing in terms of saving people, saving the country money. Work is good because, on a social level, it integrates people into society. It helps you build those sort of support networks, those relationships. I've got friendships with colleagues who I've worked with, and they'll be, you know, long-lasting friendships, I'm sure. Um, so, you know, it's not just about the balance sheet at the end of the day. It's about what it does in terms of people's um, social life, in terms of their agency, in terms of their mental well well-being, in terms of, of their overall health and so on. Um, so we shouldn't, you know, get lost in the fog of, well, this will save us X, X billion pounds a year. But as I, I go back to the point that the, for many people, working today is, is mundane drudgery. That's the truth of it. Um, so what? Well, so what? Well, don't, well, fine, so what? But don't complain, then, if people think, well, why should I, why should I engage in 40, 50 hours a week? Well, of actually, when, I, when, I say, when I say so what, I guess what I mean is and what... Because in life, yeah, who wouldn't want to be, um, you know, what's that saying? Fines, um, what is it? Do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. What a wonderful sentiment and high five if you found your passion and you're living your dream. Excellent. But in reality, most people just have to keep a roof over their head and you'll do whatever it takes to keep that roof over your head. And guess what? Sometimes that work is not nice. But I think it's, we've got a responsibility as, as a society to make work rewarding for people, not just in terms of decent wages, but to create a kind of economy that actually has decent, solid jobs. And we don't do that because we, are, we, because we, we, we kind of level down. It's a race to the bottom mm. and we have, you know, transient, precarious employment for people in the gig economy and we pay them low wages to do it. And we, as I said, we, we obsess about financial services, which creates a huge disparity. All of, the, all of the money gets drawn into the South East. We've seen this over the last 30, 40 years in Britain. 
all of the money floods in to the city of London and the southeast. And, you know, the post-industrial, as they are now, areas of our country have been told, well, you're just going to have to suck it up, you know, because GDP will be a bit better, which it isn't, frankly. But because the country will be better off, we'll have the trickle-down effects. And you'll benefit from the fact that we've got, you know, one of the, the, the richest um, capital cities in the, in the world. And, in fact, when you look at those post-industrial areas, when you look at those coastal communities, when you look at places, you know, like small town, blue collar Britain, you actually seen that they have been thrown under the bus. You see, you know, societies that are riddled with social decay and violence and family breakdown and drugs and so on. And you see that they haven't benefited financially from that uh, economic approach either. And by doing that, I think we've paid a huge price economically. I do agree that we've failed a lot of towns and cities. We've closed Enormous down the industry Enormous. and no one's had the, the care. And I do think it's a, a fact of not caring. I think people have not cared to replace uh, that industry or provide good employment. I just, I guess I worry that we're selling, uh, particularly young people, this dream mm. that work is going to be this awesome thing. You're going to find peace in your mind. Sometimes work is really damn boring. It's really mundane. It's really hard work. It's really repetitive. And sometimes you have days where, quite frankly, you don't want to get out of bed and go do it. But you know what? Tough. That's life. Provide for yourself. Provide for your family, well, if thing. you can. We're talking about sort of a lot of post-industrial towns. Actually, what was the industry? Coal mining, steel mills, shipyards, that sort of thing. This was not something that was famous for installing, you know, joy in, in the people that did it. It might have offered a, a sense of, of camaraderie. In well, I tell you what, it might have offered a, a sense of, of community and camaraderie, but these were things that existed. There was enormous pride in the mining industry. These were things that existed you, There was enormous spite. pride in the mining industry. But you, look at, things, you look at those mining towns and that villages existed, and, the, and their... Let him speak, because no one... The, these were things that existed despite the work, because the work was hard and you needed things to offset. And this is the thing. You're sort of, like, talking about this as if actually everybody enjoys their work or everybody thinks they can. A lot of people work specifically so what they do outside of work is pleasure. There was That's enormous pride do. in the mining industry. You cited the example. They had their banners and they had their brass bands and, you know, they, it was a real sense of community in those industries. When Thatcher closed them down in the mid-1980s, she absolutely destroyed all of that. And, and some of those pit villages and communities now are still paying the price of that. I think if you speak to miners, they did find... It was tough, gruelling work, but they found a sense of reward in it and it instilled a sense of pride and community in the whole area. But is the point of modernity not to move away from that situation where actually people don't have to go down mines, they don't have to go to mills, they don't have to And now to we've got an energy crisis. Well, we've got an energy crisis because we've decided to go for net zero, which doesn't... And we decided to... I mean, honestly, if we want to get... That's an entirely different conversation. Yes, that's true. But actually, what I... What I understood the human condition as, as being is that progress means that you no longer have to do menial work and you don't have to work the nine-to-five. And actually, if you can find a situation where people can exist there and not have to sort of end up retiring at 55 because their bodies are broken. That would be a positive thing, I would have thought. Uh, and you speak about broken bodies. There'll be many people today, actually, uh, that genuinely are disabled or genuinely uh, cannot do work. And I imagine that when you hear these kind of clampdowns and all the rest of it, I imagine it could actually make people feel very anxious about what is to come. If you are one of those people, uh, get in touch and let me know what goes through your mind uh, when you hear Rishi Sunak talking about launching consultations about things like PIP and all the rest of it. Uh, get in touch with me all the usual ways. Uh, I'll return to some of your comments after the break, but before that, uh, I also want to touch on another story, which is uh, about the Met Police. They threatened to arrest a Jewish man. Do you know what he was doing? Apparently, looking Jewish alongside a pro-Palestinian march. What on earth is going on? See you in two. This is GB News. Britain's News Channel. Squatters in London have taken over a pub which is leased by Gordon Ramsay, no less. The pub is currently up for sale with a guide price of £30 million. Um, it is understood that Kitchen Nightmares host Ramsay called the police on Wednesday but was unable to have the squatters removed. The Metropolitan Police said in a statement they were made aware of squatters at a disused property but added, this is a civil matter and so police did not attend the property. Let's see what my panel make of this. Why can't we just boot squatters out? If we own a property or lease property, why don't we just boot them out? I know that's tempting, but the fact yeah. is, long-term empty properties have increased by 24% in the last six years. There's 1.2 million people on the social housing lists. 
people don't have a place to live. What it does highlight is the enormous um, disparity in fairness in property laws in this country. It's just not fair that if you've worked all your life and invested some money in property because, you know, interest rates at zero and there's nowhere else to invest your money, and then suddenly somebody who's got no claim to that property and doesn't seem to have earned very much in life takes over your property. It's an outrage. People shouldn't be squatting in people's, other people's homes or, or restaurants. commercial properties. But the fact is, until we sort the housing problem in this country, none of this is going to go away. The, the fact is, people my age yeah. won't be able to buy a home unless they've got a bung from their parents. Yeah, but what's the practicality uh, uh, of this demonstration? It, it, it's not a demonstration. It's not going to free I mean, up more housing for people who are no, on the No, of course streets, not. It? It's people looking to find a place to live. I don't think it's a demonstration at it, all. It, it, it's an anti-wealth, anti-property owning demonstration by people who've got nothing better to do in life than uh, <laughs> break into other people's property. <laughs> Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. If you want your news to be straight talking, this is a nightmare for the Conservatives again. Down to earth. It's not just Nottingham where this is happening, is it? And most importantly, honest. Hard-working, middle-class taxpayers, they'll get their button thrown at them. Then catch me, Martin Daubney, Monday to Friday, 3 to 6 p.m. on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, I'm Michelle Juby with you till 7 o'clock alongside me the political commentator Benedict Spence and the trade unionist and author Paul Embry. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Ruth has been in touch. I was asking uh, just before that break, there'll be people out there that are on disability benefits, uh, perhaps you receive PIP or whatever as well, um, and you will feel, I guess, uneasy today. Ruth um, says, please, can everyone stop suggesting that people on PIP are work shy? Many of us also do work and we do pay tax. Um, she goes on to explain then about additional support and equipment that's required uh, and she says please can everyone stop demonizing uh, the disabled Matt says uh, your guest is right I don't know which one though Matt uh, he me, says, definitely, me. definitely, definitely him me. he says uh, he says once we all had well-paid jobs in industry now we have Mac jobs that offer people nothing you, you missed our conversation in the break Matt see. because I was just arguing to Paul people in my view they should be out flipping burgers at McDonald's or whatever if that's what it takes to provide full their family um, he's laughing at that I think I think what's wrong with that and I think actually the fact that so many people think there is something wrong with that uh, is probably part of the problem that we've got in our society today anyway tell me your thoughts but let's move on the Metropolitan Police has been branded uh, beyond appalling uh, this is after an officer essentially threatened to arrest a Jewish man if you ask me, he wasn't actually doing anything. He was trying to have a meander around, trying to cross the road, but his crime was that there was a pro-Palestine march taking place at the same time. Watch. You are quite openly Jewish. This is a pro-Palestinian march. I'm not accusing you of anything, but I'm worried about the reaction to your presence. People here now, we can escort it out of this area so you can go about your business the way you want it freely, or if you choose to remain here, because you are for the breach of these people, you some other I mean, how on earth is his presence antagonising an apparently peaceful march? Uh, anyway, let's listen to what um, that chap has to say about this. We weren't part of any kind of protest or counter protest. We were just walking wherever we wanted to as Jews, as free Londoners, supposedly able to go wherever we wanted to. Except we weren't able to go wherever we wanted to. I might disagree with some of their decisions, but these people, these officers, are being put in impossible positions. Week in, week out, they're being asked to police huge protests with very few officers. To be honest, 
I feel very sympathetic towards frontline police officers and the situation that they are facing when they're told to police these marches. Benedict, what do you think to that? I think the last line that you heard just there, that he's actually very sympathetic towards the officers, I think is... That's the thing that I've been feeling throughout this, because a lot of people have been getting very angry about the language that was used. You know, police officers have a very difficult job. They are not necessarily linguistically dex dexterous. That's not what they're there for. They are there to keep the peace. Him saying, the police officer saying you're openly Jewish is not offensive, it's a statement of fact. The issue is not that language. The issue is that the presence of a Jewish man in central London could provoke people to be violent. And in that situation, the police have to judge that actually it is more effective, if you like, to arrest or move on the Jewish man than to police the crowd. Presumably because they don't have the numbers and they fear that it could descend into a riot. That is what is being implied here. Even though they wouldn't say that out loud, that is very clearly the implication. If that is the case, why are these marches still allowed to go on? If the presence of Jewish people in the vicinity of a march is enough to, you know, foment a breach of the peace, is uh, enough to potentially provoke violence, that is what is unacceptable. Not a police officer pointing out to a person, look, if you stay here, these people could get rowdy, that's quite dangerous, and I have a job to do here. I feel quite bad for this police officer being put in this position, and he shouldn't have to be in this position, because this should have been nipped in the bud months ago. These marches have been going on for a very long time. They haven't actually achieved anything, that's by the by, but still, there is a sense of menace, there is a sense of animosity there. Even though we are told, oh, it's only a minority of people who behave in a certain way at these marches, it is clearly there, and it is clearly enough for the police to feel that they ought to move on and threaten arrest to other people if there's any suggestion so you, that there might be violence. So what are you saying, then, that those pro these protests need to be stopped now? Yes. I, I, for a long time, I, it is unacceptable to me that a minority group in Britain can feel that they are not able to walk in parts of their own capital city because just by being Jewish, not Israeli, let's be clear, not Israeli, by being Jewish, they risk the threat of violence from people who are racist against them. That is unacceptable. Paul? No, I completely disagree. The vast majority of people on these protests are peaceful, Benedict. And the truth is that many Jews have also joined these protests. So, you How know... How many? Well, I, I think we actually... We always hear this, many Jews. It's a handful of people who have very extreme fringe religious beliefs no, no, about no. what Zionism... In the Labour movement, there are many, many people in the Labour movement, I speak from experience, who are supportive of the Palestinian cause and have joined these protests. So, of course, we should be compassionate uh, about any Jew who, who does feel unsafe and, you know, we should address that. Um, but actually, there's been... No violence on these marches. If, the, if there has been, I haven't seen it. Um, and actually, the vast majority of people who are taking part, including many trade unionists, including some people who I know personally, I've never been on one of these marches, by the way, but I know people who have been, and considering the numbers that they've drawn, um, the arrests have been minimal. And as I say, I don't think, so far as I've seen, there's been any violence at all. So to me, to say they should be banned is, I think, completely undemocratic and wrong, and he's taking a sledgehammer to crack the proverbial walnut. Either we believe in freedom to protest or we don't. What we can't do is say, well, we only believe in freedom to protest if the protest accords with my particular view, or if I feel after a few weeks the protesters have made their point. It's not for you with respect to say, well, the protesters have already now made their point, they should be banned from marching in future. It's for the protesters to decide whether or not they've made their point. Provided the protests remain peaceful, which I think they have been, um, then I absolutely defend the right of people to continue protesting, regardless of whether people support the message in the protest or not. Well, people chanting Kaiba Kaiba Yayahud is anti-Semitic and it has been heard many times. It is a deliberate incitement to violence and they do it because they think white people don't speak Arabic. That is why they shout. Benedict, That's Benedict. why they've stopped shouting from the river to the sea and they've kept, kept shouting that. It is unacceptable. You, you, if you were marching down the street singing Nazi songs about Jews, you would be arrested. Yeah, and why I'm, is uh, this... Sure, exciting? and I've got no problem with And people... this is my problem. You say there haven't been many arrests. That's partly because the police are in a really sticky situation. They don't have the numbers to arrest people to potentially threaten that situation. They don't necessarily I've, know what they're looking for. I've no you heard, you know, you heard a police officer rather clumsily say, oh, you're obviously a Jewish man, you're very clearly a Jewish man, and that's caused a bit of a ruckus, because if you say the wrong thing, it causes a bit of a storm. I've no you problem know, with people being arrested, though. Benedict, where they've committed an arrestable offence. Of course they should be arrested and carted off. I've got no problem with that at all. But what you can't do is tar the entire protest and everybody on that protest um, with that particular brush of being an extremist. I went on an anti-Iraq war march back in 2000 
and three. And I looked round, and uh, you know, 50 yards behind me, someone had a banner of Osama bin Laden. Okay. Now there were hundreds of thousands of people on that march. The small minority of people who may have had sympathy with Osama bin Laden were not representative of most people on that march who were ordinary people and trade unionists and fellow members of the Labour Party. So did you say so anything on. then to that fellow that had no, that banner? No, it was, it was 50 yards back and there were hundreds of people in but between again, us. But, but the, point, the point that I'm making is, is the logic, about the logic is of the your position... of an entire ethnic minority, the, the best integrated ethnic minority in this country. So are you, are you saying then that the marches should be banned simply because a minority of extremists, and it is a minority, let's be clear about that, are uh, peddling a particular message of hate, which I, I don't contest that. Some of them undoubtedly have been a small minority. But are you saying that all of the marches should be banned? So you've got this, you've got this war raging in the Middle East. Whatever side people take on it, it's, it's a, 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 an appalling conflict which has resulted in massive loss of life and people are intensely passionate about it on either side of the debate. And what you're saying is that people who feel passionate about it in London on the pro-Palestine side uh, should no longer be able to march because a handful of people within their ranks have peddled a hateful message. That's, what, that's your argument. Any march that means that British citizens cannot walk and go about their daily lives in their own capital city but on account can. of their re religion or well, ethnicity, which this there? gentleman clearly you just, could you just with the rest, no, that is was, unacceptable. Hold on. That was a clumsy interaction with a police officer who was trying to head off a potential flashpoint. But now, this I is not the first incident uh, but, of Jewish but, but, people being bundled away or people but, with counter-protest signs or anything like that. It is not the first time. And actually, we had the Labour Party going to the Speaker of the House of Commons suggesting that members were being threatened with violence, that things were being pushed through people's letterboxes. Actually, to suggest that just because it hasn't broken out into mob rule, it's all fine. No, we're talking about the threat of violence, we're talking about the threat of intimidation, and that is ongoing and that is unacceptable. You can, so you can't ban a march because you're worried that somebody might at some point on it threaten violence, because if that were the case, then you would frankly never hold marches because there's the, the capacity on any march for some idiot to, to, to turn violent. At the end well, of no, the no, day... you're talking about an individual potentially turning violent, and you keep on also saying it's a small minority. It is a sizable enough minority for the police to clearly feel very concerned about this. Well, a sizable minority what? In, uh, the sizable minority are doing what? Are they, well, we thre are they threatening violence against Jews? A sizable Again, minority? I bet, I bet, yeah, are, are they carrying out violence, violence against, against and Jews? And from the river to the sea if is you, very clear demonstration if, talking if, about genocide. In my opinion, yes, if, that is a threat you, of violence. If you see those marches, and, and although I haven't joined one, I was in central London once and, and, and saw one go past. I maintain, because I know people who have been on them, there's lots of people from the Labour movement and the trade union movement and from the left, but not exclusively from the left. The vast majority of people are peaceful. The vast majority of people would have no truck with any form of anti-Semitism and would challenge it. And while I accept that there are a small number of people who are using it to peddle extremism, I don't doubt it. The, the key thing that the police must do is to arrest people who are inciting violence or threatening violence and to accept the fact that the vast majority uh, are, are not... That, that, that those small minority are not reflective of the vast majority, because otherwise we're into a situation where we say, right, we're going to ban this protest because of a, a few people who are, uh, who are peddling extremism within it. That then sends a green light to people to say, well, if you ever want to get a protest marched in the, uh, uh, a protest banned in the future, just turn up, shout a few messages of hate, and then the pressure will be on the police and the local authority and but the But the police do to, seem to, to be trying to... Either we believe in freedom to protest or we don't. But the police do seem to be trying to arrest that fella. I think I've got a clip of it as well. I think this is the second time it's happened now. That fella, have I got this video where he's um, showing he has a Hamas, a terrorist um, banner or thing. Can I show you that now? Yeah, can we see this? So this is... Um, you've seen this before, actually. He was arrested. Um, and this, apparently, a similar incident happened before, and I, it concerns me. This fella just has a banner, and he basically says that Hamas are terrorists. Hmm. And I've seen him... I mean, that is a statement of fact, by the way. But I've seen people jostling him, trying to get hold of him. Hmm. He's had to be pulled away for his own safety. So there's something not quite right there it, when you well, can't even make a statement of fact like that without being subject uh, to potential uh, violence. Absolutely. I, I completely defend the right of that person. And Hamas are terrorists. And I completely defend the right of that person um, to, to organise a counter-demonstration, even if he's the only person on it. And as long as he's acting within the law and he's not threatening violence himself, which he clearly wasn't, I support his right to display his message that Hamas are terrorists. And I think... Yeah, that but they keep trying to arrest him. And then a lot well, of protesters wrong. keep trying to beat the fellow Michelle, up. Michelle, they shouldn't...
shouldn't be arresting him. It's wrong. But there are too many people at the moment who like to make great player free speech, but are, are currently exhibiting a certain amount of selectiveness. They, they, you know, they believe in free speech up to a point and freedom to protest up to a point. And either you believe in it or you don't. What do you make to it? Long story short, the uh, Met Police have said sorry. They're saying it's, uh, they shouldn't have used this term, openly Jewish. I don't know, is, is that offensive in this day and age, if someone's wearing a religious symbol and that makes you realise that someone follows a certain religious um, set of beliefs? Is that offensive? Anyway, the police have apologised for saying that. Um, and they've also, well, you can read it, actually, on your screen. They say it was a uh, poor choice of decision to talk about uh, arresting him, etc., etc. Anyway, what do you make to it all? Uh, I'll have some of your response responses to that after the break but I want to ask you as well about do you care where your food originates from do you try your best to go and buy British would you pay more for it tell me see you in two Hi there and welcome to the latest GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Showers today will ease overnight with skies clearing. It's going to turn chilly with a touch of frost in places as higher pressure moves in from the west but that will bring a fine start to the weekend for many of us. Finally, a period of settled weather. But for the time being, still some showers out there. They're going to ease as they spread south through the evening. And then after midnight, most places will be dry with increasingly lengthy clear spells and lighter winds. That will lead to temperatures falling away three to five Celsius for many, but close to zero in some shelter spots. So a touch of frost first thing tomorrow. However, Plenty of sunshine from the word go. One or two mist and fog patches soon clearing from Northern Ireland. And then the best of the sunshine really across Northern Ireland, Western Scotland into parts of Wales and the South West. Elsewhere it does turn a little cloudier into the afternoon. And we've still got a bit of a breeze down the North Sea coast. That will make it feel cool, 9 or 10 Celsius. But in the sunshine and lighter winds elsewhere, 13 or 14 Celsius. Very pleasant. There will be some outbreaks of light rain in the far north on Saturday, spreading into central parts by Sunday, a cloudier day for many. And those dribbles of rain will push into the Midlands by the end of the day, making it feel a little disappointing. Monday sees further light rain across central parts, some sunshine elsewhere. The latest GB News travel. Good afternoon, I'm Jules Buckley, Glasgow. The M8 are lane shut both ways between Anderston Cross at Junction 19 and West Street at 20 and big queues for a police incident. A westbound M56 at 14 towards 15, so towards the M53. A lane out for a vehicle having a tyre change causing queues. Big queues either side of Junction 16 on the M6, that's the Stoke and Crew turn off following an earlier collision, but all lanes are back open now. Northbound M40, Loudwater Junction 3, up towards the High Wickham Handy Cross Roundabout Junction 4, an overturned vehicle, and that means queues and a lane closure in place, and long queues and two lanes shut for the anti-clock M25. After Godstone at 6, there's been a collision. The queue's there for half an hour back to Rygate there at Junction 8 this afternoon. And for now, that's your latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Hi there, I'm Michelle Jubry. Till 7 o'clock, the political commentator Benedict Spence and trade unionist and author Paul Embry alongside me. You're not quite divided on that last topic. Um, Anne says uh, these pro-Palestine marches should be banned. Uh, the reason, she says, is that there's barely any arrests is because there is two-tiered policing um, happening at these events. Edward uh, says you're spot on, Benedict. British Jews should not uh, be treated like this. Max says, but uh, what was that police Officer supposed to say, he says, um, the Jewish chap may well have been uh, may well have been waving a red rag and standing in front of a bull. He knew what he was doing and he did it on purpose. But Mac, what was he doing? 
He was just out for a walk. Mm. And this is, the, this is the point. Are we seriously suggesting that if an individual who happens to be Jewish just goes out for a walk, that that is indeed, like what you're saying, a red rag to a bull? Surely that's wrong, isn't it? Get in touch and tell me. Anyway, look, let me ask you this. Uh, there's been an investigation into food labelling in this country and the amount of foods that are labelled with so-called Made in Britain labels. And actually, when you dig into it, um, they're actually primarily made often with ingredients. So, for example, it'll be a meat pie that perhaps has been assembled in a production line in Britain, but the key meat ingredient, etc., comes from wherever. Um, do you, how much do you think people care about this buy in Britain thing? I, I care a lot about it. I don't know how much the average person... Do you? I do. I feel very strongly that British farmers actually should be prim primarily... Unless, you know, I, I want a specific item that is almost certainly going to originate from overseas. I don't expect the average British uh, farmer to have a pineapple in December, for example. But actually, you know... More or less, actually, I do feel that, you know, your economy sort of relies on some fairly basic things, energy, as we touched on earlier, but also food production is an essential part of that. So you would deliberately hunt out food yeah, that's do. got a Made in Britain label? I do, and I'm, I, I, I go further than that. I try to avoid supermarkets where I can. I go to uh, markets, I go to butchers, I go to greengrocers, I go to stuff where actually I can... But you've obviously got from. a few quid then, because to <laughs> yeah, go, no, to, to, go to markets to, and stuff like that is expensive. Am, I am happier to eat less food and pay more for it. I think that that's a perfectly happy trade-off. You know, it, it, we're always being told, aren't we, that this is an obese nation and everybody has huge BMIs. Fine. I eat slightly less food than I might otherwise do and I pay a little bit more so for it. And quality, I'm fine. not quantity. Well, I'm fine to do that because I know that it's going to a British farm. <coughs> I know that that money is going somewhere that I can sort of think about tangibly and it's keep being kept in the economy. Whereas, you know, OK, you're cutting corners, you're going to the supermarket, you're paying less. You don't know about the welfare of the animal. Mm, you don't necessarily, true. as you say, you don't know what country it's going to. I don't think that's necessarily... I understand. I perhaps can afford it. Other people, you know, they've got different circumstances. It's not for everybody. Maybe not everybody has the time to do that. Fine, I get it. But for me, it's an important thing. Paul? You may be surprised to hear me say it, but I'm not a massive fan of these sort of buy British campaigns. I think, you you, you know, you, you, you do it and you have a bit of a burst, but then it kind of fiddle, fizzles out after a while because the truth is that people, especially during a cost of living crisis, people just want the products for the lowest possible price and... You know, well, millionaires like Benedict can obviously <laughs> afford to buy British at Waitrose or whatever upmarket. I don't know whatever the market is that you go to. Um, it, 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 look, for, for a lot of people, it's a really difficult time. They're struggling to make ends meet. And I think while, as a sentiment, they would like to be able to say, well, yeah, of course, I'm going to support British industry and British farmers. That's something that I'm going to do. Uh, their financial constraints upon them often make it impossible to do that and they have to go for the, the cheapest product. The, the, the real thing is, why are our products so expensive anyway? Why are we so uncompetitive as a nation in, to, in the international marketplace? I think there's all sorts of reasons for that, one of which I think goes back to the original conversation we were having about we're obsessed with financial services rather than the real economy where goods are made and wealth is created. Um, and, you know, we're obs we've always, for the last 40 years at least, had, in my view, an overvalued pound, which has made our goods uncompetitive in the international marketplace uh, and has seen imports flood into the country. All sorts of reasons as to why people uh, are not able to or don't buy British. But as a, as a wider strategy, I just don't think it works, frankly. Um, Matt said... You were chuckling away while I was speaking there. No, you've I was got, not. You've I now got, laughing you've at you. You've now got to disclose what I know, you were chuckling I wasn't laughing at you. It's, I've got to say, right, I do, of course, listen very much uh, to what these chaps either side of me are saying, but I also listen to what you guys at home are saying. So I'm on this website looking at your comments and I'm also looking at your emails as well. And sometimes some of you do uh, write in stuff that does make me chuckle, but it's often not fit uh, for broadcast, I have to say. Uh, so I won't be repeating what I was reading. No. Thank you very much. Uh, Matt says, if I insisted on only buying British, I'd have no possessions and very limited food. He says, my advice is buy Italian and live in style. Uh, OK. Um, who else is this? Lynn says, I would like all supermarkets to have a British food section uh, because she wants to support British farmers. But what do you think then? Because if I saw a meat pie that said made in Britain, I would just assume that that was meat that was uh, British. I wouldn't assume that what they meant was they put a bit of pastry around it, um, I don't know, in Clacton on Sea or whatever, and therefore it was British. So sometimes I think these things are a little bit misleading. Gareth says, I try my best to always support my local butcher. Christine said, I would 
definitely be um, prepared to pay more money because I want to support uh, British farmers and manufacturers. Uh, Alan says, I will always do my best to buy British food to help the farmers, but the problem is everybody wants cheap, cheap, cheap and not quality. And he says, and also, please can you say that this government does very little to support British farmers. Keep your thoughts coming in. After the break, right, I want to ask you a very simple question. Do you think it's poor parenting to give a three-year-old a smartphone and to let children as young as five use social media? I do, but apparently I'm oversimplifying things. Am I? See you in two. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. So many of you have been getting in touch over the WASPy issue. And actually, I just want to bring forward a view from Tony, uh, who has written in to say uh, something that we haven't included in this conversation well, so then. far. Tony says, it was well publicised, stop all the crying. His words. He says the Pensions <laughs> Act 1995 provided for this change. It was marginally sped up in 2010. But the fundamental issue, the WASPy issue didn't come about in 2010 or 2011. It came about in 1995. Yeah, people, people know that the, the legislation was earlier, but the problem was is a lot of women weren't told. Beverly, who's a WASPy woman, has written in saying, were the WASPy women living under a stone? I am one of the women who was affected by this change. My peers and I were fully aware of the changes. It was widely discussed on TV, radio and in newspapers as soon as the decision was made. We weren't happy at the time, but we recognised that it was fair. So it's wrong to spend billions in this way. I'd rather the post office people who suffered so much were reimbursed. Well, I think for the social contract to work mm. and for our society to be cohesive and harmonious, if that's possible, you can't just have <laughs> people who, 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 who don't work or don't, or don't have much, have all the, receive all the, all the benefit. Well, now you're arguing against people. You're saying that people should have, in, to some extent, have looked in 1995 when the change happened. But, but fundamentally, it's not, just, it's not just WASPy women who've been screwed over since the financial crisis. We have a 70-year high tax burden. Someone earning uh, £60,000 this year will pay more tax than someone earning £60,000 has, uh, has ever had to pay before. Yeah, but Tom, Tom, you These do realise this isn't the first time that we've well. had hugely high uh, tax rates on income. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Hello there, I'm Michelle Jubry with you till 7 o'clock tonight alongside me, Benedict Spence and Paul Embry remain. And it's Friday, so Jubry's having opens, you know the drill. Cheers, everybody. Happy Cheers. weekend to you. Cheers. We're all parling around. So was it Jen's house afterwards mm. for a takeaway and a film? We just need to get her address. Mm. <laughs> Bring a bottle and an LP. She didn't reply. I messaged her back on the forum and I said, it all sounds good, we'll come round. She didn't reply and tell us where she was. I think, that's, uh, I think that means we're not invited, basically. The people in the gallery have got their glad rags on. They're all bottling I know, we're all ready, well. yes. Times yeah. are tight. We need free takeaways wherever we can get them anyway look let me tell you about this story i think it's absolutely absurd a report out today says a quarter of children aged between five and seven um, are using social media and get this right apparently children as young as three have smartphones i think this is lazy parenting right and i put a tweet up to that um, effect uh, Lord Jim Befnell, he replied to my tweet and basically said i was uh, parent shaming 
and that I was wrong, um, that lazy parenting is an easy cop-out of shaming all these people and apparently this is a complicated issue and parents are begging for help. What is complicated? Oh, and then he started talking to me about a sales strategy aimed at these children. There is not a sales strategy aimed at three-year-olds, there's a marketing strategy. Yeah. The sales decision comes from the adult. Mm. And I don't think it's complicated to say that if you're an adult buying a smartphone for a three-year-old, you probably need to look in the mirror and question your parenting. Well, I was going to say, if you're being successfully pressured by your three-year-old, then there are some serious questions that have Good to be point. asked about your, your willpower in general. Um, I think, you know, we, we had this issue before when it came to things like video games and we had TV, you know, is too much screen time bad for children? Demonstrably it is, but phones are significantly worse for people than the television ever was. And, you know, perhaps, you know, video games somewhere in the middle, but actually something like, uh, what, what was it, CBBC, actually that relatively is harmless compared to something that is quite literally designed to stimulate dopamine hits mm. time after time after time. It is addictive, that's what it's for. It's why the founders of the organisation that made the iPhone do not let their children have iPhones. It's why social media is banned in China, for example, mm. unless it goes through very stringent tests, so that it isn't addictive for children and there are limits on how much time children can spend on social media. Now, a lot of people might say that's very draconian. Maybe it is. But there are reasons why. And I think it's a really damaging thing to outsource your parenting. I understand it's very difficult. I'm speaking as somebody who does not have children. I understand that it is an incredibly difficult, time-consuming, tiring thing. But surely there has to be a better way than going out and buying an expensive piece of addictive technology, giving it to your child that has not yet, you know, developed the capacity to think critically for itself and go, there you go, that'll make my life easier. Indeed, Paul? Yeah, I have a cousin who lives in China and, and he uh, said that they uh, kids there are only allowed to use their smartphones for 45 minutes a day and then it automatically cuts off. I don't know exactly how, but it automatically cuts off. They, they can't do more than 45 minutes a day, which I think is entirely sensible. I mean, I have to say, I've come around to the view that I think smartphones for under 16 should be banned. Ooh, uh, right. I, I really do think that that's the, that, that's the right thing to do. Why do you need um, to ban them? Well, because I, I just think we're only learning now and we will continue to learn as the months and years uh, unfold the damage that kids being hooked up to a screen for, in some cases... Well, say no to your seven... kid. If your kid's pestering well, I... you, give me this, give me this, say no. Michelle, I know that and you know that, but the truth is that lots of kids are doing it regardless. Now, They're we... not buying up smartphones regardless of the parent. Where no, do they get £1,000 no, from? But, but what I'm saying is, look, you and I as parents may regulate it strictly, and lots of parents do, fair enough, but the truth is that lots of parents don't, and we've got kids, youngsters, teenagers... Uh, who are looking at these things and we don't know what they're looking at because they're so technologically advanced kids now, more so than the parents yeah. in lots of cases. I've got two kids who are more techno technologically advanced than me when it comes to smartphones and apps and stuff uh, and they're looking at stuff and, and in many cases they'll be looking at pornography or violence and, oh, and ex ex makes me sad. explicit material and I think we're, we're ruining people's childhoods and we're stripping the innocence from people uh, and I don't think we've got a grip on this issue as a society soon enough and it's almost now trying to shut yeah. the stable door after the horse has bolted but they should be banned for under 16s I'm, I'm really firm in that view. Do you agree with that? Yeah I think especially actually since the wars in Ukraine and the second one in Gaza started I don't think a lot of parents are aware of the amount of violent stuff that is actually on the internet right now, just there for anybody to see. Yeah. I know, but come on, parents. I, I don't think we can... I mean, trust me, right? I'm not some saint jubilee when it comes to parenting. It's hard yards, I can tell you, especially if you've got multiple children. I get it. But come on, we can't just say as parents we're not aware of what's on the internet. We need to be aware. Our job is to protect children, and saying no to our children on occasion is the basics of parenting, isn't it? Uh, one of my viewers has got in touch saying, Michelle, never mind smartphones, just give your kids fags, beer and pew blockers and they sorted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, gents. Thank you, Farage. Up next in the night. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there and welcome to the latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Sky is clearing overnight. Most places fine as we start the weekend with high pressure in charge. That high pressure moving in from the west. Still a bit of a chilly breeze from the north, but as high pressure moves in, skies are going to clear, winds are going to ease, and under lengthy clear skies and with light winds, temperatures will fall away. A few mist and fog patches possible for the likes of Northern Ireland and some frosty conditions as we begin the weekend. So gardeners beware, temperatures in urban areas 3 to 5 Celsius, but as low as minus 3 
for the likes of Northern Ireland, North West England and North Wales. Temperatures, though, through Saturday morning will quickly rise because of the widespread sunny skies. And it stays sunny towards the south and the west for much of the afternoon. However, it tends to turn cloudier further north with some outbreaks of light rain moving into northern Scotland, where it will be fairly chilly. And we've still got that breeze down the North Sea coast making it feel on the cool side. Warm in the sunshine elsewhere and another sunny day to come for Northern Ireland, parts of southwest Scotland, West Wales and southwest England on Sunday. Bright skies also into the southeast. Elsewhere, increasingly low cloud and some patchy rain and drizzle for Northern England and eastern Scotland. Monday brings further cloudy skies for many with some patchy rain, but it stays relatively cool. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. I'm Julian Brett. In Manchester, the anti-clockwise M60 is closed. A car has caught fire between Junction 1 for the Stockport Pyramid to Junction 27 for the Portwood Roundabout. Those queues are solid. Back to Junction 5 for Princess Parkway. The clockwise stretch, you've got a lane closed at Junction 1 for the Stockport Pyramid as well. That's adding around half an hour to your journey. In Derbyshire, the northbound M1, we've got a broken down van blocking a lane. Uh, recovery work is underway between the two Tip shelf services and Junction 29 for Chesterfield. Those queues are back to Junction 28 for Alfreton. And in Berkshire, the westbound M4 has a lane blocked by a broken down car from Junction 10 for Wokingham to Junction 11 for Reading, causing a patchy delay along that stretch. There's more in half an hour. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. Gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News. The